start off with something that is of huge use. Um, actually, no, I'll start off with a joke. Uh, David Ogle used to tell this joke. It dates it, and so I apologise for not updating the gender of the participants. But the joke is an old advertising joke, and it's that a copywriter, an art director, and an advertising account man are boarding a plane to go to a client presentation. And it's slightly implausibly, they open the overhead locker and a genie pops out. And the genie says, I've been stuck in that bloody overhead locker for 10 years. As a reward, I've only got three wishes, but I'll give you one each. And the genie turns first to the copywriter and says, what's your wish? Said, I think I'd like the life and the prose style of Hemingway. I just like to live that life. I'd like to write that way. I can't think of anything better. And boof, the copywriter disappears. Turns to the art director. What would you like? It's got to be Picasso. You know, think about it. The locations, the lifespan, the eye, the beauty, the women folk. I like the life of Pablo Picasso. And boof, the art director disappears. And so the genie turns to the advertising account man and says, what about you? He says, I want those two guys back. I've got an important meeting in two and a half hours. <laughs> And in that joke, there's a kind of analogy, I think, for the present day, which is that we've sometimes allowed the urgent to actually drown out the important. The short-term consideration drowns out the long-term consideration. But in the process, rather like that account man, we may also be ruining it for everybody else. And I'll come to that thought, but I'll start with something which I always share in my presentations for a very good reason, which I think it might save somebody's life in the room. Genuinely so. This shows how extraordinarily subjective our perception of time is. Now, you're all familiar, well, those of you over 35 who can afford a car, are familiar with the thing around the outside. That, that's a speedometer, OK? That's denoted in miles per hour. And the thing on the inside is an interesting thing, which has only really recently been, well, not invented, but publicised, which is a paceometer. Now, that shows how many minutes at that speed it takes you to go 10 miles. So assuming you're going 10 miles, OK, at 10 miles an hour, it'll take you an hour. So the paceometer shows 60. Now, most of you will have noticed something a bit strange about this, which is that whereas the numbers around the outside are completely regular, the numbers around the inside are absolutely anything but. Now, the reason I always share this with people is what it shows is that Actually, if you're going 10 miles or 20 miles or 30 miles, something in that order of magnitude, OK, there's a really, really big time saving to be gained by going at 30 miles an hour rather than 20 miles an hour. In fact, you'll save a whole 10 minutes, OK, just by accelerating by 10 miles an hour. On the other hand, if you accelerate from 80 to 90, for example, or 70 to 80, you basically save a minute. Now, some of you may have noticed this thing with your surprise if you've got a GPS in your car, You've noticed that you're driving along the motorway at 60, you realise you're going to be five minutes late for an appointment, so you welly it. And after driving at an insanely fast and dangerous speed for about eight minutes, you suddenly realise your arrival time has only improved by one minute. This is fascinating because to a physicist, they're exactly the same, OK? But when I present the information about time and distance in a different way, OK, your reaction is now completely different. What it effectively says is, you know, going quite a bit faster when you're going slowly is a really big gain. Going very fast when you're already going fast is actually the action of a dickhead. <laughs> Basically, once you hit a comfortable 65 or 70 on the road, OK, don't bother. That's enough. It's a waste of time because the risk you actually in you encounter, the risk you incur on yourself, the risk you actually effectively impose on other people by going any faster is utterly pointless in term terms of time saved. That, by the way, explains why very high-speed rail is kind of dumb. Because for very high-speed rail to save you any time, you have to be travelling the kind of distance where, to be honest, you might as well go by plane. Okay? It's why there isn't really a case for those super-fast trains. So that's a useful application of just reframing time, of looking at it in a completely different way, which, as I said, I think might save somebody's life, truly. Here's a slightly more venal um, or mercenary application. It fascinates me that all rail um, ticket buying applications basically assume that you're in a hurry. It's kind of odd, right? Maybe you want to save money instead. This, on the top, 
okay, is the ticket from Waterloo to Exeter to St. David's. Now, it takes about an hour longer. It's very scenic, okay? These are first-class uh, tickets. I don't, that's how I roll, okay? In, 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 in clear defiance of WPP's transport policy, which is, let's face it, drawn up by a bunch of people in the finance department who never have to fucking go anywhere, okay? Um, but... Um, <laughs> In order to find that vastly cheaper ticket, you actually have to search Waterloo to Exeter St. David's and type in via Salisbury. Okay? Unless you do that, the computer, the algorithm will not show you that ticket. Not because it isn't cheaper, it's a lot cheaper, not because it isn't nicer, it's actually a lot nicer. Okay? You might even go through a few Tory constituencies, who knows? Okay? But because it's slower. There's an assumption that we want to save time. And this even comes across with a massive row that briefly surfaced online, which is Google Maps refuses to offer scenic routes because they might be biased. Okay, so actually, it's somehow considered objective to optimize around short distances, short times, even if it routes you to an area which is downright dangerous, presumably. Okay, but actually saying, why don't you take a bit more time and go the nice way? No, no, apparently that's biased. And then you get the whole question of what happens when you give a load of engineers a brief. And I always ask the question, if you'd taken the brief for high speed too, what would have happened if you hadn't given the brief to a load of engineering firms who immediately focused on speed, time, distance, capacity? What if you'd given the brief to Disney instead? Okay? They would have said, first of all, we're going to rewrite the question. The right question for high speed too is, how do we make the train journey between London and Manchester so enjoyable people feel stupid going by car? That's the right question, okay? It's not about time and speed and distance. Those things only obliquely or tangentially actually correlate with human behaviour, human preference. Disney there will be asking the right question. Why does that question never get asked? Because it's an open-ended question. And business people, governments, politicians, aren't looking to solve problems, they're looking to win arguments. And the way you win an argument is you pretend that what should be an open-ended question with many possible right answers, make it enjoyable, have free booze on the train, put Wi-Fi on the train, have a ball pit on the train for kids, which are the Disney answers, those are multiple and involve subjective decision-making and um, human, what you might call human judgment, okay? You can't win an argument with those. What you do is you pretend this is a high school maths problem with a single right answer. You solve for the right answer using high school maths, and then nobody can argue with you because apparently you haven't made a decision. You've simply followed the data. Okay? This is a massive problem in decision making that we try and close down the solution space of any problem in order to arrive at a single right answer which it's difficult to argue with. It's fundamentally a massive creative opportunity cost. And yet, there are brilliant examples all over the place of people tweaking time subjectively. This is one of my favourites, the Uber map. doesn't change how long you wait for the taxi, it changes the quality of the waiting time by reducing uncertainty. Actually, if you look at human emotions, although humans might say, I don't like waiting for a taxi, what, what actually makes them uneasy is the uncertainty of the arrival and the lack of trust. It's not actually the duration. So we're optimising for the numerical thing, time, speed, we're not optimising for the emotional state, which is disquiet or anxiety. As you can see, advertising, you can rebrand time. There are quite a few cases of this. Good things come to those who wait. What was the one downside of Guinness? Bartenders hated it because it took sodding ages to pour. Okay? In fact, if you wanted to make bar staff hate you, you just put in a whole huge order for drinks and then and crisps, and then end, end, end up with and a pint of Guinness, okay? And they think, shit, I could have been pouring that while you were telling me about the other crap, okay? Take a weakness, turn it into a strength. There's also the whole question of time that we regard it as a kind of commodity, as if it's fungible, as if 10 times 10 minutes is the same as one chunk of 100 minutes. In human terms, this is absolutely not true. I, I'm not going to have time to read it now. This is a little paper by um, Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, called Maker's Schedule, Manager's Schedule. The mere consciousness of an engagement will sometimes worry a whole day. That's Charles Dickens. In other words, if you try and break up your day into lots of little chunks of time, your productivity is massively destroyed, even though the time available is, is pretty much notionally the same. One of the worst mistakes we ever made 
was we made email instantaneous. We should have built in a two-hour buffer unless you flagged the email as time-sensitive or urgent. Why is that? Because now everybody has to check their email every 10 or 15 minutes on the off chance that someone has sent them a time-sensitive email. So the burden falls on the recipient, which means everybody, rather than the sender, which means one person, to actually sift the urgent messages from the important but not time-sensitive. It has literally been a productivity disaster. Uh, in fact, um, a total catastrophe. No one talks about it. It's really odd. This is a fundamental catastrophe, the fact that people have... In fact, one of the greatest ways you can improve your productivity is just setting your server to only check for new emails about every two to three hours. There's an extraordinary case. I mentioned this bias towards time-saving, that faster must be better. And I've got to be careful to preserve anonymity here, but someone I know who's a very, very good expert at Transport for London who does research for them, and I'll keep their gender and identity secret in case they don't want this to be known, found out in research that... Quite a lot of people, quite a lot of the time, actually enjoy commuting. They, much en they enjoy the commute home much more than the commute to work. I think, if I'm right, men enjoy it a bit more than women. That's as I say, men a bit like skyboxes. We've got a standby mode, OK? You know, we like a bit of staring. If you look at coarse fishing, 95% male, right? Why is that? Because coarse fishing is basically staring with equipment, OK? <laughs> right? But nonetheless, quite a lot of people enjoy their commute time. And there's good behavioural evidence for this because economists have noticed that people actually live a bit further from work than they optimally should to create a kind of chronological buffer between where they work and where they live. We actually like that decompression time. And so this person announces the research to the people responsible for transport modelling at Transport for London. And they say, you must never tell anybody that. It's absolutely wrong for you to say that people might actually enjoy a train ride. I went, eh? But it's kind of true. He said, maybe it's true, but all our models that justify transport investment assume that travel time is always a disutility. In other words, the more time you spend in transit, the worse off you are. If you come along with fancy ideas suggesting that people may sometimes prefer slower to faster, it fucks up our whole model. So this is what's happened to the world, which is optimization models actually trump human preference. Okay? The people who actually want to win the argument with the model effectively are prepared to ignore human truths in order to preserve the integrity of the artificial model. And if you want a really good book on this, The Account Unaccountability Machine by Dan Davis, uh, which has only just come out, is a fantastic book where people create these models effectively because if you can reduce decision-making to an algorithm or a formula or a process or a procedure, okay, you avoid the risk of blame. Computer says no, effectively. It's a whole great principle where instinctively people love to codify things and make them numerical and make them what you might call optimization problems with a single right answer, like that. Because if you make that bumpy, the second you acknowledge any ambiguity, okay, you now have to exercise choice. Whereas if you can pretend there's no ambiguity, you haven't made a decision, you can't be blamed, you can't be held responsible. What's the first thing you remove if you want to remove ambiguity from a model? You remove human psychology. Because human psychology, particularly around time, is massively ambiguous. I think we just spend far too little time talking about this. We've had an extraordinary change with the invention of um, video conferencing. Not so much the invention of it, but the normalization of it. Virtually no time is spent discussing how we best use this technology. The assumption is that if we each use it optimally for ourselves, it will be optimal for the system as a whole. But the great lesson of W. Edwards Deming was, if you want to optimize the system, you have to sub-optimize the parts. There should be rules about this. It should be concentrated around Friday, whatever it might be. I mean, I did actually meet the marketing director of Zoom, I hate to say this, in 2019. And I, I suggested they focused on Friday. Thank Zoom, it's Friday. Create a day around which this activity... And then just as she was leaving, I said, of course, um, what you really need is a major transport strike or a small pandemic. And I, I feel a bit sick every time I remember saying that, OK? But I mean, we're a full-service agency. We put her in touch with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, <laughs> anyway, we should be thinking about this a lot. 
It's a complete game changer for any service business, any B2B business. It's a very, very significant technology, which, like email, can be hugely beneficial if we coordinate it and catastrophically bad if we leave it to individual actors. But we're making the same mistake all over again. This is a book I can recommend, by the way. They make the point massively about email. They make the point that in algorithm design, there are things called switching costs. Every time you switch from one process to another, you basically lose efficiency. Any kind of use of human time or indeed computing time, which involves rapid switching, is basically inefficient. And at some, in some cases, catastrophically so. And yet we're completely blind to this. We're also blind to the possible downsides of accelerating things. Unbelievably, in the 19th century, when they finally built a railway to California, people, I'm not making this up, people actually said, imagine how much leisure we'll have if we can get to San Francisco in two and a half days rather than two weeks. They actually imagined that your clients wouldn't know that the railway existed, so you could pretend you'd gone by ship, spend 10 days playing golf, and then turn up by train. Unfortunately, that information actually became widely known, and you were expected to turn up in two days. And this leads to a problem, I think, which, which bedevils many, many technologies and many behaviours. It starts as an option, it then becomes an obligation. And we welcome the technology at first, because it presents us with a choice. And then suddenly everybody else has to adopt the technology, and we suddenly realise we're worse off than we were when we started. You can see that with things like four in five motorists want to get rid of parking apps. Now, it's not just parking apps were bad, necessarily. It's because they went from being an option to being an obligation, to a point where people were installing them in kind of basement car parks where you had no chance of a mobile signal. And that's the kind of thing that happens. And it's worth remembering that when behaviours become universal... They affect everybody. This is a shot of a concert, OK? Now, you could argue that this urge to photograph everything prevents people from being in the moment. And you could say, naively, well, that's an individual choice. If you want to watch the concert, watch the concert. And if you want to film the concert, film the concert. But there's a problem there, because even if, if you don't want to film the concert, the behaviour of everybody around you is basically fucking up the concert. And the weirder thing, when I researched this more, is the people it most ruins the concert for are actually the performers, who say, we used to be performing to a live crowd, now it basically feels as if we're just doing something to be sucked into people's telephones. It doesn't feel the same to perform anymore because of this behaviour. So when one person does something, fine, it's an option. It's something that somebody does. When these things become more widespread, they morph from being alternative options to basically being social norms, conventions, from which you have no escape. And there's a great book about this by a German sociologist called Hartmut Rosa, whose work is really about social acceleration. That effectively, he, he dates this back to the Industrial Revolution, that the acceleration of things has in a way made us miserable because our choices are no longer sufficiently limited that we feel we can accomplish everything we want that essentially we've created an acceleration and an explosion of choice which will permanently leave us feeling fundamentally unsatisfied or under-optimised. It's a very, very interesting thing to read about, actually. No coincidence, I think, that they chose the front cover of the book, uh, Turner's Rail, um, Rain, Steam and Speed, which is, of course, a painting. The hair is basically being mown down by the train or running in front of the train, which is basically a painting exactly about that issue. Now... I don't think you can also, by the way, I, I searched for the picture for this, and uh, unfortunately for about the next two days, I just got ads for MAGA merchandise, so there you go. Um, I don't think anybody who's alert to advertising slogans can fail to notice that there's something retrospective in all of these slogans, okay? Make America Great Again suggests actually a return to the past. Take back control, again, is a past referential phrase. I've got a vague soft spot for it, although I shouldn't, for the alternative für Deutschland, who have a slogan, Germany, but normal, OK? <laughs> I think you'd be tone deaf to the population. I have to say, that is quite good, actually, OK? You'd have to be tone deaf to the population not to realise there is some source of disquiet with the pace of change or the extent to which it is being imposed without asking people on the assumption that it's inevitable. And I would argue, if we look at this scarf model, 
a massive acceleration of things combined with an automation of things, combined with a kind of what you might call, I suppose what Dan Davis might call, unaccountability uh, sinks, basically makes us miserable because it diminishes our status because we can't actually make any decisions. We have to refer to something else. It, it totally destroys our sense of certainty. It, it reduces autonomy. It reduces the human interactive reciprocal nature of relationships by effectively streamlining everything to the point of being impersonal. And I think it also massively attacks fairness. But the point about time, which fascinates me, is I often say that the opposite of a good idea can be another good idea. I mentioned that Guinness thing. You can turn the slow pour of a Guinness into a virtue. You can take a long train journey and you can turn it into a benefit. You know, go on that train from Waterloo and pack a hamper. Actually, it's a day out rather than a tedious journey. The great thing about the human brain is it can process the same thing in two different ways. A mathematical model can never cope with that. So every mathematical model concerned with time, every algorithm, will assume that faster is better. And as they mentioned with, for example, sex, there are certain things you shouldn't try to accelerate. Okay? Yeah, 3.25 minutes, that's my personal best. Okay? <laughs> that's not a good idea. All right? Um, and I owe this to a very valuable insight to my colleague Colin Nimick, a very brilliant copywriter at Ogilvy who said, in New York, people speak fast. In the American South, they speak slowly. Both of them are a form of politeness understood in a different way. In New York, you speak quickly because you respect the value of the other person's time and you don't want to take up too much of it. In the South, you speak slowly because you want to respect the person by showing how much of your own time you're prepared to give to them. Th there are two behaviours which depending on cultural context, are intended to attain the same end while being completely opposite. And I think human psychology is absolutely packed full of these things, a kind of union of opposites. If you read, um, for example, um, uh, the book Influence by Robert Cialdini, what you realise is that actually many things are successfully sold by opposites. Everybody has one of these, so it must be good, or not many people have one of these, so it must be good. Okay? You can achieve the same emotional effect with an opposite thing. There are two great ways to check into a hotel. One of them is totally automated, where you walk straight to the room and use your phone to unlock the door. The other one is where someone takes you up to the room and makes you a cup of tea. Okay? They're both great check-in experiences. They're completely opposite. And so we've got to understand that what's daft is that sometimes, as an option, self-checkouts are great. Okay? As an obligation, they're, they're bad because sometimes the time spent in the process is where the value comes from. The value of something depends on it being done slowly because the value is in the journey, not necessarily the destination. You can see this because people on a Saturday love nothing better than to shop in the most inefficient way possible. Okay? That's basically what a farmer's market is. Okay? It's basically, let's take a Tesco and reverse everything, okay? You've got to go to seven different places to buy anything. Uh, you've got to have a chat with everybody you buy something from, okay? It's basically the mirror image. But we enjoy them both, depending on the context. Starbucks actually forced people. They said, stop making two drinks at once. You're only, in fact, sorry, you're only allowed to make two drinks at once. They actually deliberately slowed down the process because they realized that the, the parallel processing, the batch processing of coffee, was destroying the experience for the consumer because they didn't feel they were getting a handmade coffee. They just felt they were part of a kind of Fordist production line. And they deliberately slowed the process down. Now, that's contrary to my own retirement idea, which is to found a chain of coffee shops for railway stations called Flat White or Fuck Off. Okay? <laughs> and the plan behind this is... I like this craft experience, okay, in the high street, but if I've got to catch the 647, I don't want to be queuing behind some tosser who wants to make an iced-based drink, okay, right? So the whole point of this is you tap your credit card, you pick up the flat white, and if you ask for anything else, well, I think the name is self-explanatory, okay? Now, we actually see this problem of time in the whole economy. This is William Baumol's model of cost disease, which is we have a crazy world... This basically explains the whole world since about 1920, where manufactured goods, where you can enjoy extraordinary efficiencies of production, 
you can compress the time and effort required to make something, have massively reduced in cost, and services have massively, which are time dependent, have become more and more expensive. That actually explains, if you think there's a hell of a lot weird with the world that was completely different when you were a kid, like the fact that a television is almost an impulse buy, but you agonize about getting childcare, all right? If you think the world's weird, when basically in 1920 it was the other way around, Agatha Christie had three servants in her early life, but couldn't dream of being able to afford a car, okay? That's what's basically been happening. But when it comes to selling, some things you've got to sell slow. When I bought one of these cooker taps, which is absolutely brilliant, by the way, okay? Now, yeah, I know you're spending 800 quid on a kettle. Right? I get the logic. My wife used to work in procurement. She came up with all this banausic crap, okay? The fact is, it's a miracle. It's brilliant. You get boiling water straight out of a tap. They actually gave me a 30-minute sales demonstration to my family over Zoom from their showroom in Manchester. Now, that's expensive compared to, say, some programmatic advertising, but that's how long it takes to sell that product. What I think we're doing in advertising is we're starting to define our target audiences, not as the people who could potentially buy our product, but as those people who are prepared to engage with us in, at high speed in low-cost media. Okay? Now, I think there's a fundamental correlation between, in some ways, the expense of a medium Okay, the amount of time and effort that gets invested into an act of persuasion and how persuasive it is. I think there's a costly signaling system at work and I think our drive to efficiency in advertising is actually self-defeating. Now, let me just then explain very briefly my concern very quickly with... Um, well, actually, I'll give you this example here. These people had triplets. They wanted to buy a house in Chesterfield. They wrote a handwritten letter to 15 people who had a house they'd like to buy but which wasn't on the market, or 25 people it might have been, okay? About eight people responded, okay? Five people, I think, invited them round and they had offers from four of those people. Now, bear in mind, none of those people had their house on the market, right? When you think about it, that's pretty weird, okay? A life decision as momentous as do we want to sell our house? No, okay? Is changed by a handwritten letter. That's an extraordinary act of persuasion. That's an extraordinary kind of nudge. It's an extraordinary kind of stimulus. And I think it works precisely because of the effort they invested in the communication. I, I genuinely think the weight of that communication was driven by the fact that it was actually handwritten. Now, here's my point, OK? I'll end on this, because I know they're panicking now, OK? <laughs> Most of you, if you were students, wrote essays or something like that as undergraduates, as students, right? Fairly confident to say that nobody's actually kept them, right? Nobody's reread them. In fact, the essays you wrote are totally worthless, okay? Of course, um, okay. However, I realize I'm showing my age by showing a handwritten essay here, whereas, of course, you young people get your parents to type them for you. Um, no, anyway, but um, the value wasn't in the essay. The actual end product is worthless, Okay. What's valuable is the effort you had to put in to produce the essay. Now, what AI essays do is they shortcut from the request to the delivery of the finished good and bypass the very part of the journey which is actually valuable, which is the time and effort you invest in constructing the essay in the first place. The essay is worthless, okay? You'll never go and reread it, and if you do, you're embarrassed. What was valuable about that essay was the effort required to produce it. Now, what I think will happen in AI advertising, if you're not careful, is actually the valuable part of advertising is, to some extent, the process of producing it, not the advertising itself. Because it forces you to ask questions about a business which people mostly never get around to asking. What do we stand for? What, what's our function? Who, who do we appeal to? Who's our target audience? How do we present ourselves? How do we differentiate ourselves? How do we make ourselves look different and feel valuable to the people who encounter us? Okay? Jerry Bullmore has said, if you're a B2B client with no media budget, you should still produce an advertising campaign, even if you never run it, because the process of producing the ad may actually be more important than the ad itself, rather like the process of writing the essay is actually more valuable than the finished product. I think what we'll find ourselves doing is there are things in life which you want to telescope and compress and accelerate and streamline and make more efficient. And there are things where the value is precisely in the inefficiency, in the time spent, in the pain endured, in the effort you have to invest. That's actually where the value comes from. 
And I don't think we're going to differentiate between those things because I think, like the guy at Transport for London, the automatic assumption is going to be that faster is better. And we need to understand when actually we need to deploy slow. So I'll end, actually, with a very weird question. What does slow AI look like? We've automatically assumed that the way we react with it and the way we interact with it is instantaneous. Are we sure that's right? Would it be interesting to be able to say to an AI, look, over the next three or four months, can you just give me some ideas about holidays in Greece? Okay? Do we want to make that decision immediately? I don't think we do. I think we want to see things, refine things, consider things. I think we want to mull them over. I think we want to discuss them. So the vital question is, the general assumption which is driven by these optimization models is always that faster is better, that email has to arrive instantaneously, you know, that the more you communicate, the better it is, and every communication channel should be instantaneous. I think, along with, I think, uh, Helmut Rosa, I think there are things we need to deliberately and consciously slow down for our own sanity and actually for our own productivity. But at the moment, if we don't ask that question about what those things are, I think we'll just get things terribly, terribly wrong. So thank you very much indeed.